So I want I want everyone to just I want to establish a few ground rules here. Um, if you open up the Talmud and you look for references about JC or ha- as he is known in Hebrew Yeshu or Yeshu Hanatsri, that was his name. Natsri is from from the Nazarene. You actually won't find anything about him. You look from beginning of the Talmud to the end of the Talmud, you won't find anything uh, because it be, you know in the Middle Ages the Roman Catholic Church censored the Talmud. They took the copies of the Talmud and they, they f- compelled the people who copied the manuscripts and eventually people that made the printings to delete and not include any of the passages about J.C. in the Talmud. Uh, and therefore, when we talk about Jewish sources, Jewish literal, l- 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 literature that discusses J.C., we have a hard time finding them. Um, they, you know, Jews are always fastidious about maintaining the accuracy of their manuscripts. Uh, when Jews were persecuted, when they were sent into exile, they didn't take with them their, you know, their car or their fancy stuff or their golden. So what they, they took with them most above all is manuscripts. Preservation of accuracy of text is a big deal. So we actually have today. Uh, we have an, a book called Chesron Tashas, which, which means the things that were deleted from the Talmud. And in it, we find all the sources uh, that were taken out by the uh, Christian censors. Um, now, these sources, uh, if you make a quick scouring online to look about what the Jews have to say about Jesus in their literature, uh, are greatly misconstrued. There's a lot of misconceptions about them. What they actually say and what they imply. And unfortunately, this has been a source of a lot of anti-Semitism um, because it's not just a question about criticism of literature. It's, it's for a lot of people like this is very important and therefore what we say or what we don't say about their Messiah or their God is very important to be accurate. Um, you know, we, there's been, needless to say, we all know this is true, there's been thousands of of Jews that were slaughtered about allegedly what we did or what we said about JC. Uh, many books have been written, have been burned, which to us is not a big deal. You know, you burn a book, you go buy the, go to the bookstore and buy another one. But if you're, it's the 1260s or 1240s, and the only copies of Talmud you have are one that are copied by hand, and you take and the Christians take 20, 24 wagon loads of Talmuds and burn them, that's a huge deal. That's a tremendously disruptive the Jewish way of life. So, so let, let, let's first examine uh, um, just what the sources actually say. So, like we said, the name that we find in Jewish sources is Yeshu or Yeshu HaNatsri. Um, the big question, the, the, the million dollar question in, for, for the sake of our discussion is, is this the same guy that's the Christian Messiah or Christian God? The JC of the Christians. Because that's absolutely not clear. Um, we have multiple yeshus in the Talmud. Uh, some of them may be linked to the same time period as the Christian JC. Um, others are clearly from a different time period. Are these one guy, these two guys? There's lots of theories that are speculated upon how many yeshus there. Is there one, is there two, is there even three yeshus? And the name Yeshu, by the way, might have been a very common name. So Yeshu is like a variant of Yehoshua, Yehoshua. Joshua is one of the names, the name of Moses' primary disciple. It's a common name. I, my son is named Yehoshua. It's a, it's a very common name uh, in Jewish life, Joshua. Uh, so if you have this nickname of Yeshu or, you know, Yeshua or Yehoshua, that's not a very uncommon name at all. So may, there might have been tens and tens of people named Yeshu in ancient times. Are they referring to the same guy? Who knows? Um, what kind of references when you say that name? What, what are the references? Yeah. So we'll get to the references. We'll get to them in a second. So I just want, I want, want to lay, like I said, lay in the ground rules. What, what are we talking about? What are the problems? And how? what do we know for sure? What, what's in doubt? Um, incidentally, and this is a theme we'll see again and again, the Christians have been very cynical with regards to always attributing what we say as, uh, you know, as subterfuge to try to deliberately mock JC. For example, the name Yeshu. So it's a Yud and a Shin and a Vav. 
which they say that we is a name that we gave to JC because Yeshu can also stand for Yamach Shemo Vezichro. May his name and his memory be blotted out. If you take the acronym, and it's, a na- it's, it's, a, it's an acronym that we assign to great villains in Jewish history, we call him Yamach Shemo Vezichro. And that happens to be the acronym of the name Yeshu. So they say that, that, well, that we made up a name for him because we're secretly trying to say, let his name be blotted but, out. But I assume you're implying that that's just a coincidence. I don't know. I, I mean, it means that, that has been their assumption. It's possible that was his name. Uh, or it's possible that that's what we called him. But, I mean, I, I'm not denying that claim. I'm just saying there has been a, certi- a, a certainty um, from their perspective... Uh, that uh, that they are that you know that they have always taken the side of the uh, you know of the argument by saying that we have deliberately tried to mock JC, which may be true. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that you know that has been their their perspective. Now the word Ye- what does the word Yehoshua mean or Yeshua? What does that mean? Who knows? Salvation, right? Yehoshua means salvation. Hosea also salvation. Uh, let me ask you a question. If, if you were an aspiring Messiah in antiquity and you wanted to get yourself a pseudonym, wouldn't a name like Yeshu be appropriate? So, if, you know, wouldn't that be logical? So if we were to find multiple discussions of people named Yeshu that had very uh, big ambitions in leadership, it wouldn't be a shock uh, you know, when we find multiple of them, because it's possible that they all accepted upon themselves the name. It means the name Yeshu could either mean the guy was actually called Yeshu, or we called him Yeshu because he machim over Zechro, or people assume the name Yeshu, or it's just a nickname. It means it, it's very unclear when we find the name Yeshu in Jewish sources, it's very hard to pin it down as the, the JC of the Christians. That's, that's the point I want to make uh, abundantly clear. Um, now, that being said, I'm not denying that one or maybe even all of these sources may indeed be referring uh, to, to J.C. But what is clear, at least from a historical perspective, is that the Talmud is written uh, about uh, 450 years after this person is alleged to have lived. Um, so it's not a historical document, and in fact, we don't have any historical documents uh, that, that he even existed. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written at the earliest, 30 to 60 years after the death of said individual. And the Talmud, once again, is also dealing um, many hundreds of years later. Uh, so what we find, if we are to find discussions about Yeshu, and we can indeed be sure that this is the same Yeshu Hanotri, the same... The, you know, the, the same uh, Jesus of Nazarene, uh, of the Christians, what we'll probably will find is that it's not necessarily a historical account, but it might indeed be a theological discussion. Because this is what the Jews may say about J.C. It's not necessarily contemporary eyewitness accounts, because remember, it's written hundreds of years later. That being said, it's still teaching us some lessons. It's still giving us a perspective. Okay, so let's start with the first, the first source. Now, by the way, if you actually open up a Talmud, even today, the Talmuds are printed without these, uh, without these um, portions um, being included. Um, the first source, and what's interesting, it's very interesting what they did in the 18th century, maybe it was in the early 19th century, when they actually published this version of the Talmud, they knew that there was missing pieces, and they actually made it clear in the margins. If you actually look at the page, it looks like it's missing. Here, this is, the, this is the first page. If you notice, um, this is the Talmud. Actually, we'll attach to the Talmud. In the inner margin, you'll have Rashi. and the outer margin, you have Tosfot. All the other stuff on the side, that's, that's added stuff. That's added, you know, those are all the things in the margins that this particular edition gives you. What you'll notice is that the Talmud here ends over here. It's like there's 30% of the page is left blank. While as this one goes all the way to the bottom, and basically every page in the Talmud you ever look at goes all the way to the bottom. You know, so here's a little bit left over, but 
Here you find like 30% of the page is blank. And they're essentially trying to hint to you that there's more here, but that wasn't included in the actual text. So what's this talking about? This is talking about um, the laws of capital punishment. Uh, and many people have taken this Talmud as being the most damning evidence uh, to, so to speak, our guilt in the, uh, in the killing, uh, in the execution of J.C. Well, let's exactly, let's demo what it says. So this is talking about someone who was convicted of a crime in the Jewish court of law when that was, uh, when the Jews had sovereignty over Israel and the courts were in session. And as we may well know, there were four different kinds of uh, crimes, or four, four, four different kinds of punishments that would uh, allow for four different kinds of capital execution. Uh, and the most stringent one is what's called stoning, which essentially is we shove a guy off a cliff. Not a good way to go. Um, and it's talking about what happens if they find someone to be guilty. Uh, so the Mishnah starts, it says, okay, they find him guilty, and then even though the guy was already was convicted and we say he's guilty, until he's actually executed, there's still deliberation to see if we can find a reason for acquittal. The, the theme in the Jewish laws of capital punishment is always let us try to find acquittal. It's always about, about trying to find. We don't want to take the law into our own hands, so to speak. Uh, the Talmud makes it clear that if a, if a court executes someone more than once every seven years, it's a bloodthirsty court. Because the laws are designed in a way that it's almost impossible to actually execute someone. Either way, let's assume we found someone uh, uh, guilty, and then afterwards, uh, the deliberations, they found a reason to acquit him, they would acquit him. It means even after conviction, we could still appeal, so to speak, and, uh, and find acquittal before they actually execute the guy. But if not, then... If they didn't find any reason for acquittal, they begin the procedures of ex- executing the guilt, the guilty defendant. And they would make a proclamation, go out town, and would say as follows. It means they would have announcements. And they would announce, this and this individual is going to be executed because he transgressed this sin. And the witnesses are this guy and that guy. Anyone who has any reason, any grounds for his acquittal, come forward. We're making an appeal to the community. We're about to execute the guy. This is the evidence. Right? These are the witnesses. This is the crime. This is the defendant. If anyone has any, th- any reasons to provide acquittal, come now. Come forward. We are very hesitant about trying to execute someone. Right? So we want to make sure very clearly let's find acquittal. That's the Mishnah. And if you open up the Talmud, it goes on to discuss other things, and it doesn't discuss Yeshu at all. However, like we said, in the missing parts of the Talmud, there is a very lengthy narrative about Yeshu. And it reads as follows. I'm going to read it in its entirety, then we're going to break it down. Uh, They taught on the eve of Passover, they hung Yeshu. And they made the proclamation for 40 days beforehand that he's going to be executed because he committed sorcery and he led the Jews away from God and he led individuals away from God. Anyone who has a reason and grounds for acquittal, come forward. No one came forward and they hung him on the eve of Passover. Uh, So the Gemara interjects here and says... Wait a minute. Why did they go find acquittal? If the law is that we always look for acquittal for someone who committed a sin of capital punishment, but there is an exception. If someone is a masis, a masis is someone who lobbies the populace away from God, then we never look for reasons for acquittal. And that's the one exception. Why? Because that's the most dangerous kind of influence in the, in the community. When someone who, 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 you know, who takes the pulpit to try to lead Jews astray. It's, so that, That's bla- blasphemy, right? Well, that's, that's not quite blasphemy. Um, blasphemy, what, that's mocking God, right? Yeah, it's, it's more like... apple spoils the whole bunch. Yeah, well, it's more, it's more like trying to convince people to commit idolatry. So trying to lobby in favor of, of, 
of, of an idol mm -hmm. of, of any sort. Um, so why would the, if, Jay's, if Yeshu, this Yeshu that we're talking about, was guilty of being a Mesis, of being someone trying to convince people to do idolatry, why would we even look for grounds for acquittal? So the Gemara says, well, no, it's different, Yeshu, because he was close to, to, you know, to the kingdom. He was friendly with the higher-ups. Therefore, we have to do everything we can to try to show as if we're trying to find innocence for him, even though if it was just based upon merit, we wouldn't look for, for any reasons for acquittal. That's the beginning of the Gemara. And the next Gemara is that um, this Yeshu had five students, Matai, Nikai, Netzer, Boni, and Toda, and they brought them all in. And they brought Matai in, and they said to him, Matai is going to get killed. Oh, I'm saying, he said to them, he says, Matai, you're going to kill Matai? Matai avove re'e him. When will I come and see the face of God? And he made, 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 made this plan words. Matai is his name. And Matai avove re'e pnei which means when will I come and see the face of God? Is Matai, or the word, the, word, the word, his name Matai is also the word, when will I come? And he says, how can you kill me? I want to come see the face of God. And they said to him, yeah, Matai is going to, kill, is going to be killed because Matai yamus, when will this person die? Quote another verse. Essentially, there's this debate between the court and the student of Yeshu, whose name is Matai. What is going to be the status of Matai? Matai is lobbying with a verse by saying, Matai, yavo, avo ver epnelakim, when can I come see the face of God? And they respond to him and say, Matai Amus, when will this guy finally die? And they go to the next guy, uh, his name is Nakai, and he says, Nakai, you're going to kill Nakai? Nativit Sadiq, someone who is pure and someone's a Sadiq, right? Al Taharod, you shouldn't kill me. He quotes a verse in, in scripture. And they respond to him with another verse Nakai will be killed. Bimistarim Yehard Nakai, that Nakai will be killed. Once again, there's this battle between the next student, Nakai, and the court based upon verses. He brings a verse to try to prove his innocence with a play in his own name, and they bring a verse to say, no, no, Nakai will be killed, because the verse says that this guy, Nakai, will be killed. A third guy, Nate's there, and once again, again, he, he responds with a verse, and they respond with the same verse. He responds with a verse that has his name in it, that says you shouldn't kill him, and they respond with a verse that says, Nate's will be killed, and again, for Boney and for Toda. Thus concludes the Gemara. Now, if you just read this, you say, wait a minute, we had a guy named Yeshu, and he was a sorcerer, and he was someone who convinced Jews to go away from, from God, and we killed him, that's what it says, on the eve of Passover. Correct? Correct. What else does it say? It says that we have, he had five students, and we killed them all as well. Uh, this seems like it's robust evidence, or at least a robust uh, a, a historical narrative uh, trying to um, you know, kind of tell the story of what happened with Yeshu. Is it the same Yeshu? Is it that, you know, that's a good question. But it seems like it's the same Yeshu. We're describing a character profile of someone who's bringing Jews away from Judaism, someone who had these five students. So it's, you know, when it's... Five students well, yeah. being taught to go away from Judaism? Well, we don't know. All, all we know is that he had five students. So they're not necessarily referring to his disciples. Well, we don't know who we're even talking about. This is clear. We, ha we, we have to realize what we know what we don't know. We know that there's a fellow named Yeshu, and the Talmud tells us what it tells us, that on the, 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 the eve of, of Passover, we hung this guy Yeshu. But 40 days before... Historically speaking, it would have been in the same timeline? Mm, that's a good question. What, historically speaking, what, um, when are we even talking about? You haven't mentioned it. Well, you said I'm just Passover, saying, but you haven't mentioned the year. That's what doesn't tell us the year. So we would have no idea which year, what, which year is referring to. But if you just read this, what would what would your conclusion be? But, but well, you said that they executed the five, uh, five five disciples, correct? Okay, but we know there were more than that, and well, there, there weren't the disciples it weren't executed. It wouldn't be any different for me than any other uh, claim of a claim of Messiah that has gone through. There's been so many of them, hasn't there, even? Yes, there's a bunch. Well, there's, there, many. There, there's been I many. Mean, I, that's true. That's true. So now, um, Yeshu uh, or, or JC in his time 
was certainly not the most impactful uh, I mean, false for messiah. The, for well, the, for the world, I mean, you have things that we've had to deal with through time, like the whole uh, BC thing, a, you know, instead of before Common Era or after, I mean, all of that. Listen. True indeed, this person obviously, you know, was put, propaganda was put forth so much that it, it changed the Absolutely, time. absolutely. I mean, it's weird. Absolutely. So we find we, we know historically that there's mm -hmm. been uh, a tremendous uh, movement and, and religion that has sprung out of this individual. Um, but at the time, was he so remarkable? Well, probably not. You know, from or Jewish sources, there were a lot of false messiahs. Remarkable. There were a lot of false messiahs. Um, and, uh, it, you know, J.C. Would, was unremarkable necessarily at the time. Later on, it became a very popular religion. Well, but my point I, is this. I'm if we just examine this text, this Talmudic text, does it tell us that we killed J.C.? So first of all, it tells us we well, killed Yeshu. Go ahead. No, the way I understand the Gospels. Uh, well, the, well no okay, but remember, this is the Jewish perspective. The Gospels are going to give you the Christian perspective. Well, but the Gospels don't, t the, the disciples were not executed like the disciples were, so it to sounds like a totally different incident. There's some similarities. I guess any murder has similarities to another murder. It's okay. just a but, batch uh, of people that they took in at the same time. Get them all. Okay, but I'm saying, I, I, I happen to agree with you that this is actually not a historical narrative, but your point that the Gospels seem to disagree with this accounting, right? Who knows how many people there were there, right? The Gospels were written 60 years later. What do they know about what actually happened in the court, in the deliberations, if this is indeed what is being described? Remember, the, well, the, the I, I Christian I'm books... Well, I guess i if some anti-Semites tried to read this as saying this is Jewish hidden literature, that Jews killed Jesus, yeah. then, then it doesn't even sound like it's the same incident. That's what true, I'm trying. True. I've heard David Duke read similar things that you have just read uh, in there. Yeah. Although he, he does it from his own perspective. But I mean, yeah, so... Yeah, so we have to understand what it says and what, and what it implies. So I'll, I want to make the argument that this is clearly not a historical accounting of a deliberation in court uh, for a lot of reasons. And if you'll notice, it's as if the Talmud is essentially telling us this is not historical. What is the first word it says? On the eve of Passover, we have, a, we, have a, we have a rule, an ironclad rule. We do not do capital, uh, uh, you know, capital um, uh, adjudications on the eve of, of holidays or Shabbos. That's established widely. That's this sources, uh, plenty of plentiful sources, for sure from the Jewish perspective, right? We don't do that. When it's telling us that we did some sort of adjudication on the eve of Passover, that's telling us, okay, this is maybe not exactly a direct narrative of, 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 uh, of a historical event. Number, number two, it says that we hung Yeshu. We hung Yeshu. The four methods of execution, none of them evolve. Well, to be precise, none of them are hanging. Right? The crucifixion is not a Jewish way of execution. The other ways of execution, right? Rarely used. But if if they are used, none of them. They're not, we don't ever kill someone with hanging well, with a crucifixion. Okay. Right? Well, hung could be hung by the neck, couldn't it? Well, that, we don't do that either. Okay, so what we do, Israel does it. Huh? They did it one time. oh, they did it, they did it once, but that was not because of Torah law. Okay. Uh, Torah law, there's beheading for someone who's a murderer. There is uh, um, uh, stoning. stoning for someone who is well, the, the, someone who is a, a a sorcerer or a macist would fall into that category, which means you shove them off a building, and if they're not dead, you chuck a rock on them. Um, huh? Uh, burning, that's right, which we don't actually burn them. It's, it's essentially they uh, pour molten lead down their throat, which just... Listen, but this is reserved for someone who sleeps with their daughter or their granddaughter or their great-grand... Or, or, or their stepdaughter, etc. Like, this is, like, for the most heinous criminals on the planet, you know? Uh, and lastly is asphyxiation, which uh, is... Uh, you know, as it is, they tie a rope around the guy's neck and they pull till the guy's dead. Remember, but these are for the most. Uh, it's, it's it's pretty bad, but like these are for the most <coughs> terrible criminals and egregious sinners. 
people that sinned while they were warned, and they said, I'm doing it anyhow. People are spiteful sinners. You almost have to want to, no, not only you almost have to, you have to want to get executed to actually be executed because the laws are so strict uh, as to the restrictions upon who we could, you know, what we could do to whom and what kind of evidence we need to have. Either way, none of them involve hanging. So categorically speaking, we would have, if, if the crime could fit the punishment for what he was doing, would have been stoned. Would have been stoned. So why would they not say that? Yeah, right. Now, what does it say? It says that he was a masis, someone who tried to convince people to go away from God, uh, yet we gave him, we tried to find reasons for acquittal. Why? Because he was close to the kingdom. Which kingdom are we talking about? Who's, the, who's ruling over Israel at that time? Romans. The Romans. At that time, we know the Romans hated the early Christians even more than we did. So why are we suddenly scared about what the Romans are going to say uh, with regards to uh, our methods, our treating of JC, if this is indeed JC? Now, I, th- I, th- I think these, these are good points, but if you actually look at the end of the Talmud where it talks about the five students... Never do you actually find the normal proceedings of a trial that we get to lobby the court based upon a verse. Matai is going to be killed? Matai of Ovi or Penelikim? Well, will I come and see the face of God? What kind of argument is that? Why are we even recording that? And the rabbis respond to him, no, Matai, Yareg. And five students, each one of those students bring a verse that has their name and implied <coughs> innocence. And the rabbis responds with another verse that has, that has their name and says guilt. It seems very bizarre. What I think is actually going on in this particular Talmud is a theological discussion. You know, Matai Avo Veirai When will I come and see the face of God? The face of God. What does that imply? See the face of God. What kind of argument is that? Y- y- yeah, okay, fine. But remember, Moshe, Moshe can't see the face of God, right? Correct? That's what it says in, in Exodus. You can't see, right? Because you can't see God's face and live, right? Was he actually As, going to die? Huh? Was he actually going to die? No. I, what I think he's saying is a theological argument. Like, the idea of a God incarnate. The idea of the, Christ, the Christian idea, which is taking the problem that we have with theology. What are the, we have a problem with theology. Right? What, what does Hashem tell Moshe? Like, what we just quoted. Right? No one could see God and live because physically there's not any interface with God. If you want to have prophecy, you have to use a spiritual interface. Physically, you cannot see God. That's just the God that we live by. You know, that's the Jewish God. Not someone who has any form or any imagery, right? And what, what, what the Christians, how do Christians circumvent that? Well, they take JC and they make him to some sort of deity. Voila, you could see the face of God. Right. I th- what I think is actually happening is, is that this is a theological argument, and I think what it's telling us is an attitude, a perspective that the Jews have with, with, with regards to J.C. And what it's telling us is this is not necessarily a historical problem. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I, I would make the argument is that they're, they're, they're deliberately pointing out the flaws with this as a historical narrative to tell you that this is not just a historical narrative of what happened, but maybe what ought to have happened, or maybe what should have happened if we had the say. Yeah, maybe we would have executed him. Maybe. Who knows? But this is the perspective. The perspective is that we disagree with them on principle. Um, Wouldn't the rabbi make a commentary on the commentary? Rabbi Lashi on one side, and then another person. I forgot the person's name. Tosmos, yes. So we we remember we don't have very, we don't have a lot. We don't have a lot, especially for medieval commentators, because they were already subject to such incredible scrutiny with regards to what they write about 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 JC, and therefore I'm sure they were very hesitant. We do have some things which we'll get to. Uh, but the, I think this is the first source. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest source as well. I don't know if it's the biggest. It's, it's one of the bigger sources. It's more substantive. And what it seems to be saying at first glance is clearly not what it's saying after examination. I'm not trying to deny that maybe we did kill him. I don't know. That's the correct answer to that question. 
Maybe what it is describing is historical narrative, but it's clearly going out of, out of its way to point out that this is not the normal court proceedings. Nowhere do we find any corollary, you know, any 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 parallel uh, example of a theological debate taking over a a a discussion on on the criminal guilt or innocence of a defendant. So that's uh, important to note. Let, let's let's go on to the second the second source here. Uh, this is. Once again, from Sanhedrin, and if you actually look at the page, once again, you'll see the same pattern that um, you see this this piece, this page of Talmud. So this is where the Talmud ends. This is all added stuff. This is actually not part of the page. Once again, you have like 30 percent of the page is left blank to show that there's something missing here. Uh, so this is talking about an idea uh, where um, a parent or a teacher or a leader should not be too uh, happy to criticize and not encourage. Uh, so it, it says the way, the, way, the way it couches this is that the, the, the rabbis taught, the left should always push away, but the right should draw close. Means whenever you want to rebuke or criticize someone, you do it with your left hand, i.e. your weaker hand. As opposed to when you want to draw someone close, you do it with your right hand, you do it stronger. It means you should always have a preference for encouragement to bring someone close than for casting someone away. And it says, unlike Elisha, who pushed away Gehazi with both hands, and in the uncensored version, and unlike Rabbi Yehoshua ben Prachia, who pushed away Yeshu Hanatsuri with both hands. Okay? So it starts off with, the, what's the story of Gehazi? And we know the story... Um, there was a uh, general, a non-Jewish general, a Syrian general, who uh, had leprosy, and some uh, young Jewish girl told him, go to Elisha. Elisha, he's the expert. He goes to Elisha, and, um, and uh, Elisha tells him, uh, go in the water, and he's like, Why, what do I have to lose? He goes in the water, and eventually he gets healed, and he's so excited, and he wants to give Elisha a gift. Elisha says, no, don't worry, don't worry about the gift. And the guy goes on his merry way. And one of Alicia's students is there and says, they offered you a gift. And you say no. They offered you like a sack of money. You're, you're going to say no. So you run after him and said to him, oh, Alicia changes his mind. He wants to take the gift. So they're like, oh, okay. He gives him the good gift and this guy actually pockets the money. And then Alicia realizes what happened and he curses him. And he... Uh, Gehazi himself, um, he becomes a leper, and his th- three kids as well become lepers. And eventually, he goes on to have a, a really, you know, terrible, terrible career. Uh, Gehazi, uh, but the Talmud essentially is rebuking uh, Elisha by saying that he was a little bit too strict in his criticism. He shouldn't have pushed him away that that far. Fine, not relevant to our discussion. In the uncensored version, it goes on to the next one. What's the story of Rabbi Yoshua ben Prachia pushing away Yeshua Natsu? What's that story? So then it gives us the whole story. Um, when King Yanai, Yanai was one of the Hasmonean kings. He was known as, Ale- as Alexander Yanai. Uh, he took on a... Uh, a policy of being very, very hard, uh, strong-handed with the rabbis, and he was executed a lot of rabbis, all the rabbis escaped. So there was a migration of rabbis to, to Egypt. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachi, one of the great rabbis, and his student, Yeshu, they fled to Alexandria in Egypt. And by the way, just as a quick note, we are talking about 100, uh, about 100 years before the Common Era. So this is obviously not aligned with the timeline that we have, the traditional timeline we have, the Christian timeline of when J.C. lived. So what happened? Um, when things settled down back in Israel, Shimon ben Shetach was one of the rabbis who was also friendly with Alexander Yanai, who was the brother-in-law of Alexander Yanai. He sent a message to, uh, to, to Alexandria that, uh, come, all, come back all the rabbis, you're good to go. Right? It's things are calm. You could move back to Israel. Um, so Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia and his students they went, and on the way they stopped off at an inn, 
And because he was the great rabbi and their students, they uh, were given some, so much honor and so much respect. And they, you know, they're treated so well. Uh, so Rabbi Yeshua commented, how beautiful is this achsanya? The word achsanya can mean an inn or a hotel, but it can also mean an innkeeper as well. So Yeshu, Yeshu, underst- well, Yeshu thought mistakenly that Rabbi Yeshu ben Prachi is talking about the innkeeper. How beautiful is this innkeeper? So he responded, he says, yeah, but her eyes are a little narrow. She was a little cross-eyed. Now, what he really was referring to was the how beautiful is this inn and how well we're being treated. But this guy, Yeshu, he understood that they're talking about the innkeeper. He's like, well, not exactly a 10 out of 10, you know. You know the eyes are a little, you know, a little misaligned. So he, he's like, wait a minute. Wicked one, is that what you're thinking about? Is that what you're worried about? So he excommunicated him. He sent him away. So repeatedly, this fellow Yeshu came back to him and said, take, take me back, take me back. He went to a town and he, he, didn't, he ignored him. Rabbi Yeshua Prakha, he wasn't willing to accept him back. Uh, one day, Rabbi Yeshua, the, the teacher, was saying the Shema. So he was in the middle of praying. And Yeshu came to him. And this time he said, you know what, I'm going to take him back. But he was in the middle of saying the Shema. So he said to him, wait, wait a second, wait a second, I'll, let me finish here. And Yeshu uh, took that as a sign that he wanted to push him away again. And he said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fed up with this. He picked up a brick and worshipped it. Basically, he did idolatry. <clears throat> uh, so after he finished the Shema, he's like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> that escalated quickly. And he said to him, repent. He says, no, I can't repent because you told me that he who sins and causes others to sin can't do repentance. There's certain limitations on repentance. Almost anyone who sins can repent. But someone who sins and makes other people sin, that person can't repent. Um, and thus the Talmud concludes that Yeshu, the Nazarene, practiced magic, did sorcery, and led the Jews astray. astray. Okay, so now this Talmud, it's a very hard to deny that it's actually telling us a historical account. Now, whether or not this is the same JC as the Christians, that's up for debate. Um, but we know who Rabbi Yehoshua ben Prache is. If this was some allegory of sorts, if this was some sort of lesson that's trying to be imparted, the Talmud would never say a name of an existing rabbi and scholar and sage and sully his name, so to speak, for the sake of a lesson. Because the Talmud starts off by saying the right hand should always bring close even though the left hand casts away. Right? As opposed to Elisha who didn't do it and Rabbi Shua ben Prachia who didn't do it. If this was actually not an historical accounting of what happened, it was just some sort of lesson, right? then you would use a straw man. Right? You would use some you know, other you know, literary tool to tell the lesson without sullying the name of of a rabbi that we know who exists. We have commentary from him. We know this is a real guy. If this was actually not a real story, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't muddy the name uh, of of this individual just for the sake of teaching us some sort of lesson. Um, Not only that, we have actually names and dates and historical where we know Kinyana and Shumachetach and we know all these people existed. Like, we have a time stamp exactly when this happened. Like, if if the Talmud was trying to tell us a historical account, that's what it would do. It would give us names of people that we know existed, time timelines, when these things actually happened, and, uh, and you know, and therefore it kind of demonstrated this is a real event. You know, we know we have other accountings of this King Yanai and his campaign against the rabbis. We have other accountings of Rabbi Yeshua and Prachia. We know a lot about Shimon ben Shetach. These are people that we know about. These are historical individuals. When we put Yeshu, or even Yeshu Hanutsri, in this category, we're telling us a historical account, very clearly. Um, And indeed, most of the Jewish discussion about this individual, Yeshu, is that this is the guy we're talking about. 
this is the Yeshu. Uh, he existed about 100 years before the Christians say that he existed, which all in all is not a surprise because the Christian accountings come much later. They're not contemporary. So they're not contemporary. If they're working off the, uh, uh, off the legend of a guy who lived in the past, the fact that they misdate him is not a shock at all. Do you think perhaps, the, has there ever been discussion as to that even he would have been blindsided by this, that he didn't expect this to, like... Who didn't? The rabbi or the student? The, the, no, JC. He didn't, in other words, like, he did not realize that he was being put to this. In other yeah. words, it was kind well, of like it's, a, it's, a, a it's, Christian conspiracy and he didn't know about it. Like, he's oh, yeah. been so, dead and gone. Yeah, so and Christianity, Christianity spirals out of control. Oh, out of control, but in an entirely different direction. Many years after J.C. died, by any accounts, yeah. by, would take the Jewish timeline or the Christian timeline, either way, yeah. what's clear is that many, many years after J.C. is actually dead, it becomes an entirely different, it becomes a new religion, actually. And it's, and it's, and it's <laughs> a political tool of the Roman Empire. Well, that's much here. That's yeah. much later. That, yeah, you know, that's I mean, hundreds that's, of years later. That's what builds it and spreads it and makes oh, it yes. the uh, monolithic the dominant, uh, thing that it is today. That's yes. right. That's right. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that a, a, as well. Uh, um, at that time in history, right, within, we're talking about the first century before the common era, even the first century, the century, uh, century of the common era, those 200 years, we find a lot of different individuals who take Judaism and fork it. Right, they take it and they, they take Judaism and make it with, take it like a, a new spin on it. Um, we have the Essenes, the Dead Sea sect. Mm -hmm. That's another example Either of a I. Jewish sect that takes Judaism and forks it, changes it a little bit, and develops their own practices and their own mitzvahs and their own uh, they didn't really consider apocryphal they didn't, writings. They didn't use the whole deity thing. Well, no, but, but they, they, went, they went in other different directions, in other directions. Um, and Christianity started as a subsect of Judaism. It was called the Jewish Christians. It was essentially Jews who were in every other way religious Jews. They went to the same synagogues and wore tefillin and studied Torah, but they just had this belief that their dead hero was the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Messianic Jews today. Well, yeah, but that's their not goal. dissimilarly. Their goal is to replicate that. To replicate like whose goal is to replicate what? Messianic Jews, like of today, that would be their their the idea. Well, they're trying to get the Jews. That that's it. well, that's that's part of it. But the idea is that the original faith would have been this, right. and they're trying to replicate that and bring it back. That's right. You see yeah. some. But do uh, they believe? They don't think they believe in the cultural phenomenon, do they? Of of JC, I think they're more of a era, a messianic era, aren't they? Well, I, I wouldn't say messianic era. From congregation to congregation. We 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 have we have always had a tradition that there's going to be some sort of great hero, who we call the Messiah, who is going to usher in a new era to the world. Mm -hmm. um, but not the Christian original. Uh, the original Christians probably uh, they, they were just Jews who had belief that this great. Um, uh, inspirational hero of theirs was the guy. He died. How he died, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But that was their belief at the time. Um, years later, uh, it took on a life of its own. When Paul came, Paul changes the you know Jewish Christian into Pauline Christianity, mm -hmm. where he makes it essentially its own religion, not in any way related to, the, to, to Judaism, oh, yeah. he yeah. abrogates the law, yeah. and it's an entirely different religion, and now it's, it's, it's only for Gentiles, really. Yeah. You can't do both. You can't be a Jewish Christian. We'll talk a little bit about that as well, and what the Jewish perspective on that, on that issue is as well. Um, but, uh, but clearly, um, I just lost my train of thought, clearly something. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but, but, but yes, um, at that time of uh, w during the lifetime and even the immediate aftermath of, of, of JC, it was nothing more than just another one of these splinter sects that had existed uh, yeah. that were popular at the time. 
And this was like at the at the era of destruction of the. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. So there was a I mean, lot was of chaos. A lot of, crap a lot of stuff going on. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We have the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the very. The Edenites. The the very very powerful sect of Jews. Oh yeah. Uh, we have these Essenes, these uh, reclusive. Are they the same thing as? Oh the no, Ebonites? very uh, Ebonites. E B O. Is it the same as the Essenes? I guess it must oh, be. Oh, no, 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 they're not. They're not the same as the Essenes? Mm -hmm. I thought they were. Okay. But we, we find in Jewish accounts the, the, the Prushim, known as the Pharisees, mm -hmm. the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Biryonim, mm -hmm. the Sakari, all these different groups mm -hmm. kind of, when Judaism gets splintered, chaos uh, yeah, ensues, chaos. always. Okay. Uh, but, you know, Judeo Christians or Jewish Christians began as a group, a group of Jews that just, they were different in only one way in their fascination with this guy, Jesus. Um, and that is not anything like the Christianity we have today. It means mm -hmm. these people wore tefillin, they prayed three times a day, observed Shabbat meticulously and fastidiously like everyone else. They were Jews like everyone else. Um, yeah. And that was a big problem. They're very concerned about keeping the writings. Well, that's that you know that's 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 always been a, a mark of, of the Jewish communities, um, but the but the writings indeed they came much later. We'll talk about that how they, how the writings came into existence uh, later, but either way, I think that if, if there is uh, a historical account in the Talmud about about the Christian uh, JC, this would probably be the one that's most that's most uh, that's most accurate. No, absolutely not. And in fact, even in Christian sources, the two places where you find the lineage of J.C. are entirely different. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? Right, remember, this guy is alleged to have had a virgin birth, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where's the dad? Later. Like, it's so bizarre to have, to, to, to link him to David. I'm sorry? But that wasn't the original, the virgin birth came. The fact that, it, even if we assume that he was linked to David, let's assume that that's true, which it, it isn't, but let's assume it is. Let's assume. Right? Let's take it for granted that this guy came from David. So what? As do millions and millions and millions of other people. It doesn't prove anything. Right? Well, we'll talk a little bit at the end as that he uh, demonstrated how he achieved none of the prophecies of what Messiah. Make it abundantly clear this is not the Jewish Messiah. We're clear about that. There's no doubt about that. Um, and indeed, by the way, that's why you have to invent the idea of a second coming. Because if Messiah didn't achieve it round one, but he's got to be the guy... Because you're totally going to come back from the dead. It must be because again. otherwise, yeah. uh, how else is he going to fulfill the the the, uh, the prophecies? Unless we say, well, maybe he's not the guy. Yeah. That's what we say. And he's also the descendant of someone else that starts with a Y. That's uh, I can't remember what book. Anyway, that it says that no one from this line will ever ascend to the throne. I forgot his name. Do you remember? Anthony? No, no. But but I mean, I, I I think what gets me about that is that. Mm. I, you know, I mean, how, uh, how to phrase this without being really rude? Um, it's like <laughs> you're making, you're making it. all of, like we make all of these assumptions and we draw all of these conclusions about who JC is and what his potential value can be based on a series of texts that have really shaky credibility and there's no real reason, there's no evidence to actually believe that they're true or accurate. And they come from a complete, they were chosen and canonized by a completely separate faith tradition that had totally separate goals. Like, yeah. I mean, it's great. Yeah, yeah and that's, but that's why I, I like to look at so. the Jewish text and the Jewish perspective because I think they're, they're much no, less biased. They're, they're much yeah. less partial. Yeah, exactly. And, and they're and likely to give us a more accurate a depiction. Being contemporary. And I think if you look at contemporary sources. If you look at the actual records we have of that time period, there's nothing worthwhile that backs up his existence. There's nothing worthwhile that backs up any of his stories. And the fact that we continue talking about him and are forced to care is just a relic of old political and cultural forces that we're forced to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it irritates me. Yes. But whatever, there's nothing I can do. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. Like, I don't worry too much about proving his genealogy or anything like that because we have no accurate sources, and I think it's all a load of crap. So, I don't know. Well, either way, a lot of people are fascinated by it, yeah. and, a, and a lot of people, and there's a lot of a lot of uh, misconception as to what our perspective is. So it's still worthwhile to go to 
through our sources. We find yeah. one more source like this. Okay, so, so, so now we have one source about a fellow by the name of Yeshu who existed about 100 years before the Christians claimed that he existed, or even a little more than 150 years. Whether or not this is the same Yeshu, I think it probably is. Mm-hmm. Um, but we find another, another description which seems to mirror a little bit more what the Christians say, but the, once again, not from the same time. So this is from the, the book in, in Shabbos, the Talmud in Shabbos. And it's talking about, uh, we know that on Shabbos, we're not allowed to write. One of the pro- 39 prohibitions is writing. And the question is, is writing a tattoo, is that considered writing? That's the Talmud's question. Uh, and is a tattoo a violation? Of well, that's a separate problem. That's, tr- that's correct. But is that, is that writing okay. or not? Um, so the Talmud starts off by talking about a fellow by the name of Ben Stada, the son of Stada. Ben means the son of. And say, isn't it true that Ben Stada brought witchcraft out of Egypt by marking his flesh? Now, what do we know that left Egypt, by the way? We have already an account of Yeshu leaving Egypt with Rabbi, Yo- Rabbi Shua ben Prachia. Is this the same guy? Who knows? But Ben Stada, he brought witchcraft out of Egypt to smuggle it out. So how do you smuggle something out, you know, without actually taking it with you? He, he, he put markings on his flesh, he tattooed himself, and that's how he was able to smuggle out the witchcraft um, out of Egypt. That's, that's, what it, that, that's the line, that's the relevant line. Now what was taken out, that, that's what we have in our Talmud. What's taken out of the Talmud is the following. Was this guy called Ben Stada? He's the son of Pandira. He's Ben Pandira. Wait, was his dad Stada? Was his dad Pandira? Who is this guy? So they say, no, Stada was his mother's husband. Pandira was his mother's lover. Okay. But wait a minute. Was his mother's husband not Papas, the son of Yehuda? Rather, so this is the final, who is this guy that we're talking about? His mother was Stada. His father was Pandira. But his, was his mother Stada? Was, her, was, the, was the mother's name not Miriam Magdala, which means Miriam the hairdresser. Says no, so why is she why are you calling her Stada? Well, she's called Stada because Sadata, which means if you break it up into two words, it means she cheated on her husband. Okay. What, what, what does that mean? Right. right. What it's saying is that this guy Ben Stada, who smuggled witchcraft out of Egypt with via tattoos, he is called Ben Stada or Ben Pandira, because his mom's name was Stada. Well, his mom's name was, was Miriam. We called her Stada because she committed adultery. Uh, his dad's name was Pandira, right? But his mother's husband was Papa Spanyuda. So we have three people here that we're talking about, right? The guy himself, his mother's name is Miriam Magdala, and but everyone called her Stara because she committed adultery. His father's name is Pandira, and his mother's husband is Papa Spenhuda. <coughs> okay, that you know that's that's number one. We find another Talmud. Once again, this was also taken out. This is from Sanhedrin, and it, this is the relevant passage. Uh, what did they do to Ben Stada in Lud? They hanged him on the eve of Passover. What does that sound like? Yeah, we hung earlier, right? Why? Uh, This son of Stada was a son of Pandira. Let me go through the story again. Um, uh, Pandira was the husband of Stada, his mother, and they lived at the time of Papas, the son of Yehuda. Was his name? Was her name Stada? Her name was 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 Mary Magdala, right? Miriam Magdala, uh, who deserted her husband. So, but what she's called Stada because she deserted her husband. That's essentially the lineage of this guy. Uh, this sounds a little bit, you know, more similar to um, to the Christian JC. Um, but there's a few problems with that. Uh, first of all, the Christian accounting of, of you know, uh, of Mary Magdalene uh, is that she was actually not his mother's two Marys. She was a follower. She was a follower. Uh, that confusion may be get in the way of, of accuracy, who knows? Um, but 
we also have a fellow by the name of Papas ben Yehuda. Right? He is the husband of this adulterous woman. We actually find other accounts of Papas ben Yehuda uh, in the Talmud, likely the same guy. Uh, it's a very unique name. Uh, maybe not, oh, oh, once again. But we find him, that he's having a dialogue with Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, um, we know, is... Um, uh, his death is at the end of the, uh, the, um, the persecution that happened under Hadrian in the year 135. And we find an account where Rabbi Tiva, oh, the, 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 the Romans say whoever teaches Torah publicly is going to get executed. And Rabbi Tiva says, we're still teaching Torah, right? Because we can't stop teaching Torah, just like can't stop, you can't stop. Well, well, let's say they made... Uh, um, uh, breathing oxygen illegal. What would you do? Would you stop breathing oxygen? You got to live, right? Mm-hmm. That's what Ricky responds to. He says, you know, yeah, they made it illegal, but what can we do? This is our life. Right. What happens? Um, Papa Spen Hitter comes to him and says, well, how are you teaching Torah? What's wrong with you? And eventually, uh, you know, we, we find out that actually Papa Spen Hitter himself got captured, but not for Torah. Remember, Kiva got captured and executed by the Romans for Torah, but Papas ben Yehuda got captured and executed for something else. Either way, that Papas ben Yehuda is in existence, or he's living, the timestamp that we have is about the year 130. If this guy is the husband of the mother of, of this guy, Ben Pandira or Ben Stada, which is the Christian JC, that once again is not aligned with the correct timeline. Maybe there were two Papas Ben Yehudas, who knows? Um, but it seems unlikely that this is actually the same guy. Um, maybe it is, who knows? Maybe the whole timeline's off. But that is, once again, 200 years after the other Yeshu Hanatsuri, the student of Rabbi Yeshua Ben Prachia. Um, what's clear is that it's not so simple what the text actually says about JC. Um, the commentators on, on this particular column point out that this cannot be the JC of the Christians because Papa's been utilized in the time of Rebbe which is 100 years later. Mm-hmm. Um, either way, so th- this is essentially the extent of the Talmud discussions, narratives about, about this guy. Um, we'll, may, we'll talk a little bit about um, how... Um, some of the Christians who have a vendetta against the Jews, they try to find other sources in the Talmud which are much more debatable as to whether or not they're actually referring to J.C. or not, or even someone who's remotely similar in any way. Um, uh, Rabbi, could I... Go ahead. Not to interrupt, but... Um, not, never interrupt. No. <laughs> I know that we're not talking about Talmudic sources, but didn't Maimonides write about Jesus or someone um, he thought was Jesus or something like that? Was yeah, but Maimonides lived in the 12th century. Right. This is a thousand years right. by I any account. Right. Uh, yeah, but we do have a lot of Jewish didn't writings he about. Write derogatory stuff. Oh yeah, clearly he didn't. He didn't like the Christians, and he didn't like the Muslims either. Um, he thought they're all they're all they're all they're all uh, imbeciles. Well, he I remember had to convert, it. Did he? Well, he didn't have to convert. He escaped. Um, uh, he, my mom, at the age of fifteen, was kicked out of uh, his family, fled Spain, where they have been living for hundreds of years, because the Almohads came. The Almohads were not unlike what we have today—a very radical uh, Islamic group that essentially gave the people the option to convert or leave, mm-hmm. or we'll kill you. Uh, so Maimonides and his family had to ha- had to flee, and you know he he was not a fan, not of the Christians, and certainly not of the Muslims. And he makes it clear, um, um, he's very unforgiving uh, with, with what he finds to be very very shallow, very weak, very feeble uh, religions. Uh, yeah, so but yeah, I'm not I'm not going to deny that the, the, the listen. I'll, I'll say this right now: the Jews have always had problems with the Christians. Today, probably less than ever. Um, uh, because uh, thankfully, uh, but we have a very long history with the Christians. You know, this is going back to the original 
uh, episodes at, at the beginning. But look at history. You know, look at Jewish history. Look at the past hundred years. How our relationship has been with the Christians. How many Jews were slaughtered because of blood libels. We kill Christian babies to make matzah. It's the most nonsensical argument. You know, how many Jews were killed because we killed their God? You know, how many Jewish towns were slaughtered during the times of the Inquisitions? I mean, the Italians today make that fact. They talk about a Jew, they talk about a Christ drug. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, and... Uh, well, what, what Italians are you referring to? Not Italians in general, or just some... Yes, the Italians. I mean, strictly Thank the Italian you. people. Yes, yes, of course. Course. Really I, I thought uh, Israel had a pretty good relationship with Probably do, maybe now, but I'm just telling you what's going on. Well, it may not be their government, but there there are people who still feel that way. people all over the world, not just Italians. That's what I was... Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, you're welcome to each other back. Well, yeah, and that's... Yeah, and in 1963, Pope, I think his name was Pope Pius, he made the official... Declaration of absolving us of killing JC, which the whole thing is bizarre because in Christian too, right? in Christian theology, you know, Jesus died for their sins, which doesn't make any sense. Right, like Point how, how are you going to be mad at us for doing the thing that makes it all work? For exactly, you? you're like, like if, it was, you, if it's the one big win, how are you going to? Well, hate I've us? heard that before. It's so, they said so that bizarre. You still got to make a choice whether to do it or not. That doesn't mean, even if it was meant to be, it, the Jews took that responsibility on themselves. So, uh, but like, but Christ, like Christian faith, like they view Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for their mm-hmm. sin, and the oh. only reason, well, no, the only reason they have salvation and forgiveness of sin is because they believe in the power of His death. Mm-hmm. And so, if your entire belief system and the entire concept of being saved and being forgiven of your sins requires this sacrificial death, then why are you going to be angry that he died? Well, that's, I mean, yeah, you that's, could, you that's, could, that's you could, the whole deal. You could rationalize and say they should be happy for they the Jews. They should be happy. Forget, they should be thankful. The, the whole thing is not logical. Or, or, or you should just, or or you should just leave it alone. But, but that's the thing. The whole thing is illogical. It's not logical. The whole thing, the whole thing is, is, is illogical. Made People up and makes no sense. You could say five different things at the same time. Yeah. And all of them are deeply held beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when it's it comes ridiculous. to faith or emotion, a lot yeah. of it is faith. It's, 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 it's that's the that's the antithesis of yeah. life. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Okay, so so, uh, but I my my point uh, I think the, the 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 two points we want, we want to make clear I think uh, uh, till now is that number one it's not very clear what we actually say, um, and number two is that if these are historical accounts, they're more likely to be accurate. Because remember, we don't have necessarily the same agenda the Christians have in trying to uh, um, develop a certain attitude, a certain perspective towards this guy, and therefore it's more likely to be unbiased. That being said, I want to look at some other sources. Yeah, except for stuff that's written much later in response to Christian persecution. What do you mean? Like, isn't there a whole, there's, there's a whole story that's, it's not actually an accepted part of Jewish canon. And Go ahead. And Toledo Yeshu, I think oh, is yeah, I have a copy of it right here. Yeah. Okay. So, we'll and, get to and that. And then that's written in response. Oh, yeah, the, yes. Okay. This is, yeah. this, this is very interesting. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, but, uh, but in, in the, um, I'll be back. So in the in the Talmud, we find some other very interesting sources that maybe would be very germane to our subject, even though they're not directly talking about our subject. Uh, for example, we find we find a discussion about capital punishment in this same book that talks about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai presiding over a case of capital punishment. The problem is like this. Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai lived after, he died after the temple was destroyed. <coughs> and we know from another place that 40 years before the temple was destroyed, so from the year 30 till the year 70, the court, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, Jewish Supreme Court, they left 
their permanent location in the temple, and they moved to a place called Chanut, which is outside of the temple. Why did they do that? Because the law is, is that unless the, uh, unless the Sanhedrin is in session in the temple, no Jewish court can actually uh, give out capital punishment. So essentially, as a way to force the hand of the courts to not give capital punishment, uh, the Sanhedrin volu- voluntarily, on their own, left the temple. So we, have, we ought to have no executions from the year 30 to the year 70. That's point number one. Point number two, Baruch ben Zakkai, he was only leading the Sanhedrin for 40 years. So the beginning of his, and to the culminate with his death, so the beginning of his uh, ascension to the Sanhedrin can only be after the Sanhedrin already left the court. Yet we find a case where he did preside over a case of capital punishment. So those three little pieces don't seem to all work together. How is it possible that Yochum ben Zakkai presided over a case of capital punishment when he was only in the court for 40 years? He lived after the temple was destroyed, and 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the, to- the, the, the Sanhedrin already left the temple, thus no capital cr- crime cases could have been adjudicated. And this problem right, uh, makes it very unlikely that the Jews actually killed him in the Jewish court of law because no Jewish courts for 40 years, beginning of the year 30 of the coming out to the year 70, actually did capital punishment. Interesting. But we do find that Ryochim Zakai did. So I found in one of the uh, medieval sources that they, that, they, that they unpacked this by saying yeah, they didn't typically do capital punishment because they moved outside of the temple, but when there was a grave need for them to actually uh, adjudicate a case of capital punishment, they actually went back to the temple, they reestablished an entrance in the temple, they relocated, and then they were free to engage in capital punishment proceedings. And then it says three cryptic words, like that particular incident. Here we go. This is the, the, the this is the source uh, in this Tosfos um, where it says that periodically, periodically, the periodically the Sanhedrin would go back to the temple when there was a grave need to oversee a case of capital punishment like that episode. It doesn't tell us which episode it's talking about. So this episode. Been, so this, to me, this is very compelling when the Talmud is pointing to a, bit, to a gap in adjudication of capital crime for 40 years when we know at least the Christian version in that time would have been the time when J.C. was killed, and we find this cryptic line in the Toast Post, like that episode. Which episode? What are you talking about? Which episode are you talking about? It's possible that they're actually referring to this particular episode. Listen, the Toast Post is written a thousand years later. It's not historical accounting. But I'm not, I'm holding out the possibility that it's possible from Jewish sources Indeed, that we did kill him in a Jewish court of law, and this is all like the story of, uh, you know, of of this guy Yeshu, who we, you know, who committed sorcery or did, who was a Masis, etc. May did ha- may indeed have been our doing. I, I don't the correct answer is I don't know, but the, that cryptic statement made me believe that maybe it's possible that we did do it. Uh, either way, there are other sources. I wouldn't say sources. There are other claims of sources that the Christians have made over the years in trying to frame the Jews as being evil or being Christ killers or being people that want to shame or want to denigrate uh, uh, JC. For example, I'll give you an example. This is ludicrous, but uh, it's still an example. We have in the Elenu prayer, right? We say that thankfully we're not like the pagans. Right. For they bow down to nonsense and emptiness. But we bow down to God. 
I mean, we submit ourselves to God. The word varik, which means emptiness, rake, means empty. But if you actually look at the gematria, varik, it's yeshu, it's the same letters. It's the same, it's, it's both of them equal, um, um, uh, the, you know, the same, the same number. If you look at any sitter, a, a, any Jewish prayer book, it has those words in parentheses. You know why it has the words in parentheses? Because Christian censors said, oh, you can't say that prayer. Hmm. You can't say that, that the non-Jews bow down or the pagans bow down to hevel varik. To emptiness and nonsense. Why? Because that's referring to, to JC, which is it, it, it's, it's ludicrous to the extent that which some people have gone to try to frame the Jews as being ones that are deliberately always ta- always hinting about JC and always trying to to, to you know to denigrate him. Um, I, I think that particular one is nonsense. Uh, another approach that has been taken is that every time the Talmud refers to Bilam. It's secretly referring to Yeshu. Uh, Bilam, we know, was the villain of the times of, of uh, you know, in, in, in the book of Numbers, we find the story of, of Bilam. He's trying to curse the Jewish people. He's hired to curse the Jewish people. He has these great powers, but he uses them for, uh, you know, for, you know, for evil. And he tries to curse, but ultimately he's forced to bless the Jewish people. And the Talmud has a lot of discussion about, about this guy, Bilam. And the Christians, um, or some Christians, have made the argument that when the Talmud talks about Bilam, it's secretly referring to Yeshu, uh, and we've gotten more persecution as a result. Uh, what does it say here? So this is one source. This seems to be the strongest source, uh, most legitimacy for that, uh, for that uh, argument. But it's, it's, I, I think it's nonsense. Uh, what does it say as follows? It says like this. It says, there was a discussion between a heretic and Rabbi Hanina. And the question was as follows. Do you know how old Bilam was when he died? Right? The, the, Talmud, the, the Torah doesn't say anything about the death of Bilam. Oh, it says the death of, it describes the death of Bilam, but doesn't tell us how old he was. So he says to him, well, there's no scriptural source, but... From the fact that I could, that we find in the Book of Psalms that it says that men of of, of evil uh, will not fill up half their days, and we know that the average age in in, in in the times of Psalms was seventy years. Years, therefore, if you don't make it to half, you don't make it to thirty-five. So it's either thirty-three or thirty-four. He says that's how old Bill was when he died. About thirty-three or thirty-four. Um, and he says to him, well, you're right, I actually found, I actually found a, a manuscript of Bilaam that it says that Bilaam was 33 years old when Pinchas the, Pinchas the thief, Pinchas the robber, killed him. Uh, why is Pinchas the robber? So uh, we, we know Pinchas is Phineas, the... The, the, the biblical Pinchas as well. Say, well. Well, this is actually referring to Pontius Pilate. This Pinchas is not Pinchas. It's Pinchas, it's Pinchas uh, it's Pontius Pilate. This, that, that's, what they, that, that's what they say. Uh, and this Bilaam is not, it's not Bilaam, it's talking about Yeshu, and he was indeed 33 or 34, and <coughs> Pontius Pilate killed him. Um, now, what's the problem with saying that this is indeed referring to Yeshu? The problem is, is that you actually look at what we say uh, about Bilaam, how Bilaam slept with his donkey, for one, uh, or Bilaam used his member to necromance and do all that kind of... It's just very derogatory things about, about Bilaam. Mm-hmm. Um, but to make the argument that this Talmud is talking about Yeshu is very far-fetched. Uh, why? Because we, we actually do have a character called Bilaam, uh, and it would seem very logical that there would be a debate as to how old he was, because it's not established anywhere. I don't know, why would they make that leap? Uh, only if you're looking to try to find a way to trip up the Jew would you make that argument. Now, there's another source that, that, they, that they bring that says uh, that uh, Bilam initially was a prophet and later was demoted to a sorcerer. And the Talmud says, well, it's kind of like a, 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 a princess who goes and sleeps around with carpenters. 
Ooh, what's that yeah. referring to? Oh, <laughs> is, is, is that is that referring to maybe is that a reference to uh, to, to, to Yeshu? Because we maybe that's that's indeed his life story. His mother was a, you know, she was married to she was maybe a part of the aristocracy, but then she went mm-hmm. to sleep around. But actually, it's that that too is nonsense, and it's just it, taking it out of context. Um, and um, indeed, um, the, the Talmud is talking about Bilam. He was a prophet. He was demoted, and then it says that it's like an example of someone who used to deal with the kings and then deals with 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 carpenters. Even though carpenter is not a direct translation, it could be also someone who Moshe uh, Asfina, which is sailors, people that pull that pull uh, yes. ships. <laughs> If you want to twist it, you could try it. If you want to convince yourself that this is a reference to JC, you can do that. It clearly isn't. Either way, but I think it's, it's part of an uh, a overall pattern where a lot of people in, 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 in history have tried to demonstrate um, that the Jews are always trying to uh, embarrass or call out uh, Yeshu. And maybe that's true, but it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's not definitely true. Uh, you see, the the, the 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 text and the literature is clearly. If it's if 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 it's if it's not definitely not referring to Yeshua, it's at least ambiguous. Um, Rabbi, uh, not to bring up Maimonides again. Go ahead. But I mean, uh, didn't he? I understand he wrote thousands of years later, but. Uh, or a thousand years later, whatever it was, uh, didn't he? Did he cite in his writings Talmudic sources for his criticism? Uh, well, he calls them out in a few different places, but he, you know. So maybe he believes some of this. Well, listen, I, I wouldn't argue that the Jews that the Jews believe that that Christianity is is a bunch of baloney. I'm not going to make that statement. Of course, we, we, we don't believe in Christianity. We don't believe in J.C. as not a Messiah, not a God. Of course not. <laughs> um, but to try to, to try to make the argument that the Talmud is full of these secret references as if the only interest of the authors of the Talmud was to write the disparaging things about J.C., that's nonsense. Mm-hmm. That part is for sure nonsense. Uh, that being said, the Talmud does talk about someone that seems very likely that that is the same guy or at least a composite character of someone who is around that same time period and doing the same kind of themes and does speak negatively about him. But, I'm, I'm, I, Steve, my, my point is not that we think highly of J.C. We certainly do not. We don't think highly not of him, not of his followers, right? We don't believe with him. Not, we, we argue with him theologically. Uh, and, you know, at the uh, most, uh, uh, you know, severe way. You know, we don't agree with him in any, in, in, in any realm, in any facet of what they, what they believe. We'll talk about that a little, a little bit later. Um, but, our analysis of the ancient Jewish literature uh, is is more nuanced than maybe a lot of people want us to believe. Uh, but yes, I want to make it clear: uh, we don't believe not in JC, not as a Messiah. We'll talk about why he fulfills none of the categories of being the, Jew, the Jewish Messiah, and certainly not of any sort of deity. Mm-hmm. Well, I certainly understand. And there is. That. I mean, I'm just. I'm just trying to see if, if the anti-Semites who use these provisions, it, obviously for their own purposes, but is there any credibility to some of the things they cite, you know, in our own sources? To uh, well, to, uh, credibility for what? Credibility for well, us to, to the theologically topic. and philosophically disagreeing with them and disproving them in, in, in any instance uh, that we get the opportunity to? Yeah, that we have. Um, the fact that it's it's possible that this that this Yeshu, their hero, was indeed, you know, the bastard, uh, like maybe like the Ben Pandira, Ben the Ben Stada, that his mother uh, slept around. And what what would you do if your mother slept around uh, and you wanted to couch your guy as being some sort of hero? Mm-hmm. You wouldn't invent the idea of a virgin birth, no? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, interesting. Isn't that a clever solution? Yeah. Work around. Huh? Because she was sent away too, right? Well, and that, that that's also a common trope 
like when you look at Egyptian and Greek and Roman mythology, mm -hmm. the idea of the virgin birth and a lot of the ideas right. that, that are associated with Jesus, sure. they are they are really common stories for mm -hmm. those gods. And mm -hmm. well, and then the whole thing, like any t if you read about Horus, you know, like the story of Jesus and the story of Horus have exact yeah. parallels. Dionysus. And, and, yeah, and all right. of them, like exactly. it's all the same exactly. made up exactly. load of crap. In my it was true. I think the purpose of it was to try and try to make it. Yeah, it's all the same story. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. I think the all the fish they talked about in you know, the New Testament, all the fish stuff, like the Pisces age, the eon of the Pisces. I mean, it's just a pagan religion. Yeah. Uh, well, we, uh, that's. Uh, it's astrological. Um, what, what is interesting, I, I want to point out that Maimonides does write about um, kind of the role, the big picture role that Christianity did play and, and was designed to play in trying to make the idea of monotheism uh, ubiquitous in the world, wherein essentially the, the sister religion, so to speak, of the Jews kind of assist us, so to speak, in getting, gaining mass traction uh, of the ideas of one God, even the, even even though it's slightly off, of course, uh, but Christianity has done a remarkable job, and Islam, of course, Islam, Islam, has, done, Islam that has done a much better job in taking the Jewish idea of God and making it and making it widespread. So, or at least at least a variant to the Jewish idea. Say, Maimonides actually was complimentary to Christians. No, no he wasn't complimentary to them, but in in in, in the. Uh, in the realm of what we call tikkun olam, of making the whole world know about God, mm -hmm. we look at Christianity and Islam as bringing people closer than what they were in prior. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the idea of Messiah is where everyone kind of gets their bearings and the Christians realize that, yeah, the idea of one God is true. JC is not uh, a relevant uh, player in that, you know, in that theological model. Uh, but they're 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 halfway home, so to speak, and the Muslims as well. They're they're halfway home. Well, the, they're more than halfway home. They're they're uh, they're 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 most of the way there because their 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 version of God is the same one as we have. Right. They reject Jesus as divine. Oh, of course. Yeah, they're monotheistic, right? Yeah. So what Christianity actually believes? It you kind of it, it's 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 a, that that's a big unanswered question. What they actually believe is three, but is a one. But who do you ask? And right, it's 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 a very naughty question uh, for the Christians. Uh, but if you look at the, the transformation that's happened to the world in the past two thousand years, we live in a world today where almost anyone you ask, uh, when talking about God, they're going to refer to something that's very similar to what we've been saying I've heard for it said that Christianity all time. Is I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a, a, a version a, a version of Torah at all. But I would say maybe Christian theology is a poor imitation of Jewish theology. Um, but it's a lot closer than than paganism that existed at the time, where the Romans had thirty thousand gods. Could Could you say that um, Christianity is was more of a watered down or certainly somewhat different version? However, Paul, Paul overthrew a lot of things that Jesus said. Because didn't Jesus say that yes, whoever so. follows, uh, disregards the commandments will be the least of yeah. yeah, Paul says yeah. it's okay to disregard them. Right? Yes, so like we said, there's going to be a tremendous shift in Christianity from the original Judeo-Christians uh, to the Pauline Christianity. And we're going to talk a little bit about that right now. So I want to, I want to talk a little bit about what you mentioned, Tales of and Nutsri. And I, I think that this is probably the, the most clear account from the Jewish perspective of, of the idea of, 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 of Christianity at its uh, early development. Um, we know we have a, a law, a very bizarre law, especially relevant to uh, tomorrow. Right, the, the Hebrew month that we're in today is, is Tevet, the tenth day of Tevet is a fast day called the tenth of Tevis or Tevet. Why? Because that's when the uh, siege on Jerusalem began. 
right? Nebuchadnezzar see, lays siege in Jerusalem. A year and a half later, um, is able to finally breach the walls and destroy the temple. And every step in the downfall of the temple is marked by a fast day. But in Jewish law, we find two other fast days. One today, the eighth day of Teves. One tomorrow, the ninth, and the tenth. And the Jewish sources say as follows. The eighth day is the day where Ptolemy translated the Torah. And we know that it's a, it's a terrible day when the, when the Gentiles, as you see, when they have their hands in the Torah, they're able to do a lot of uh, uh, trouble with it. And therefore, it was an act of day of fasting. No one actually fasts today. But it, it's kind of this fast day that pe- some people do, or, you know, in ancient times, people did. After? Whole day? The whole day, whole day, yeah. Tomorrow is the ninth day of Tevet. And the sources say that this is a fast day, but we don't know why we're fasting. <laughs> and the tenth day of Tevet is a fast day because that, that, that's when the, um, that's when the, um, when the uh, siege of Jerusalem began. Now, I want to zone in tomorrow, the ninth day of Tevet. It's probably the most bizarre thing you'll ever read in any Jewish, formalized Jewish writing. The idea of, we have a day that we're fasting as a community, uh, and the reason we're fasting is, is we don't know. Which is so bizarre. Like, we don't, there's, n- there's no other parallel that we have to that in Jewish, in Jewish writings, or Jewish law, most certainly. Uh, why would we fast but not know? Or, better yet, why would this, the reason for this fasting not be preserved? What, what happened on this day that makes it so secretive that we can't tell you what happened? Just fast, no one has questions. So there's been a lot of theories uh, over history to try to explain um, suggestions as to what happened that day. So the first suggestion that was explained is that on this day, the death of Ezra happened. Ezra, we know, is the main uh, uh, architect of Second Temple plus the Men of the Great Assembly. He established Men of the Great Assembly. Very impactful figure. And he died, and we know for sure that he died on the ninth day of Tevet. And therefore... Because to commemorate his death, we have a fast day. Now, there's a few problems with that. Number one, we don't have fast days to commemorate anyone's death. If we're making fast days to commemorate people's death, let's make a fast day to commemorate Moses' death. Well, you know, we know the day Moses died on the seventh day of Adar. Let's have a fast day on that day. We know what day Sarah died and what day Abraham died. And why don't we fast? It means why are we suddenly picking out of the hat the day we're... Ezra died as a fast day. Not only that, why, if that's the reason, let it spell it out. Mm-hmm. Like, let's say, oh, the reason why we fast on this day, I don't know, what's the problem with that? Why would you hide that? So there are those that wanted to say, well, the Moses, Ezra is so impactful, he's like Moses. And Moses, the Torah tells us that no one knows where he's buried. Right? His death is also enshrouded in mystery. Therefore, we do the same thing about Ezra. But the bizarre thing about that is that we know exactly when Moses died. We don't know where he died. We don't know where he's buried. We don't know when he died. So if this is the day where Ezra died, there'd be no problem <coughs> to tell us that the reason why we fast on this day is because Ezra died. Another reason that was um, suggested uh, was that in the year 1066, there was a terrible pogrom in uh, in in uh, in Spain, and because the people who established this fast they knew this was going to happen, right? Therefore, they kind of prophetically said this will be a fast day because of this terrible tragedy so that's going to happen in the year 1066. But they didn't want to tell us what it was because, of course, you know, if you tell people that oh something terrible is going to happen on that day then it will be very bizarre for them. Like every, every year, every year, every Jewish community will say, oh, let's be careful on that day, and like, it'll be weird. Mm-hmm. That was a suggestion that was made, which is, is it's very bizarre. And number one, okay, a lot of tragedies happen. You know, why don't we have a day to commemorate the Holocaust, or a day to commemorate uh, the Inquisition, or a day to commemorate uh, the pogroms of the 1648 and 1649? 
Uh, there's a lot of terrible things that have happened to the Jews over, over history. Why? It's very bizarre that we're going to establish in prophecy some event that's going to happen a thousand years later as a day of fasting, and I'll tell you why. It seems very, very, very strange. Uh, another argument was made is that this is the day where Esther was taken um, to Ahasuerus. If you read the book of Esther, it says that on, in the month of Teves, Esther was taken to Ahasuerus. It doesn't tell us which day of the month is. So there were those that have theorized that, well, maybe it was the ninth day of Teves, and we're commemorating that with a fast day. The problem with that is, of course, is that, okay, what's so significant about Esther going to Ahasuerus's house? And number two, well, why would the, if, that, if this was such an important day, why would you not say that the ninth day of Teves, Esther was taken to Ahasuerus and clear all the confusion? That, too, it seems like a very unreasonable argument. And then we have two more arguments. Number one is this is the birthday of Yeshu. And we actually have uh, some guy who made the calculation that Yeshu, J.C., was born on the 25th of December. And uh, the year, probably the year three before the Common Era. And someone did the math. That's the ninth day of Teves. And that's such a terrible day because all the terrible things that happened to Jews over, over, over history as a result of this individual, we marked it as a fast day. The problem with that is, is that we, we don't even know if he was born on the 25th day of, of, of December. Uh, in fact, go ahead. And if you give any credibility to the Gospels and Christian sources, they don't indicate he was born on the 25th of December either. Yeah, well, there's so many different dates, and yeah. that became the accepted date of the Western Church, but the Eastern yeah. Church still celebrates the, ni- the eighth day of January. Yeah. Yeah. So who's to, like, who's to say that this is the correct date? Not only that, since when do you mark days of birthdays as days of... Do it's we, not a Jewish thing to do. Like, right. should, we, should we look at the birthday, the, the birthday of Hitler and say, oh, let's make that a fast day? It seems yeah. very bizarre. Not only that, even if we... Let's assume that that's correct. Let's assume that he was born on December 25th. Let's assume that that's true. How do we know that that's the ninth day of Tavis? Remember, at that time, the, every month could be comprised of either 29 or 30 days, and that's based upon testimony, mm-hmm. right? Unless you find a ledger from the year three before the Common Era mm-hmm. of that particular month, was it a, you know, was, was it a, was a full month? Was it a, of 30 days, was it a, a, a smaller month of, of 29 days? You would have no idea. Yeah. It seems very bizarre. Um, What's likely to be the reason is what we find in the aforementioned book called Toldot Yeshu. So Toldot Yeshu is a book that is many, many, many hundreds of years old. I don't know if we know exactly the origin. It might even be multiple thousands of years old. We find copies of it like in the 9th century, 10th century, very, very ancient copies um, that we find today. Uh, and, but it's very hard to find the actual book because it's been censored and burned many times. Uh, but this gives the Jewish account of the story of Yeshu. Uh, and obviously it tells us that this was obviously a, a, a Jewish guy who developed a following um, that believed that he was indeed the Messiah. And after he died... That didn't quiet down. So, for example, we have many times in Jewish history um, false messiahs, and you know they come and they go. We had Shabtai Tzvi in the 17th century. It's terrible, terrible, much, much more injurious to the Jewish people than Yeshu ever was, um, because um, like a third of the Jews actually like believed that this is the Messiah, and they started marching towards Jerusalem, and they stopped off in. In, in, in Turkey, and the guy said, the, the, the sultan said, okay, yeah, you're the Messiah. Uh, really? Um, I'm actually going to kill you if you don't convert to Islam. And he says, okay, I'll convert to Islam. <laughs> and then that's, that's the short form of the story. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, whoa, like, uh, it was very depressing for a lot of Jews who really believed and sold their houses and moved to, moved to Israel. Like, this was, re- like, we were actually doing this. Uh, and it was very disappointing at that time. But once the guy converts to Christianity, uh, converts to Islam, that's it, he's done. Well, certainly now he's dead, he's done, right? Uh, but it's very dangerous. What happens when you have a Messiah who dies, but you're unwilling to let go of the fact that he is the Messiah? If you're so convinced that someone is the right guy, and then he dies, so either you drop him, that would be the 
correct approach. Mm-hmm. Or you have to invent second comings, or he's coming back, or he's not dead, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was just silly. That's right. Um, there is a certain sect of, of, of Chabad, of Lubavitch uh, Hasidim, that believed at the time that their Rebbe was the Messiah. Uh, you can find videos on YouTube of everyone saying, oh, Mashiach, Mashiach, he's the Mashiach. And, uh, and then he died in 1994. And you have a lot of people today, I've spoken to some people today, that still believe he's alive, he's not dead, he's coming back. Right? That's what has to happen unless you're willing to accept you made a mistake. You made a mistake. It's very hard for people to accept they made a mistake. If you grew up and you lived with the belief, the solid belief that this is the guy, this is the Mashiach, and this is what everywhere, all the signs are pointed to him being the Mashiach. And then he dies without going to Israel. The, the, without, rabbi, the Rebbe never claimed to be the Messiah. Well, that's a subject of tremendous debate, what he actually claimed. Or, well, what, certain, what, certainly, what, 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 what is certain is that he didn't quiet what? He didn't quiet the he didn't movement. Quiet. He, he didn't, didn't silence the. He didn't silence the movement. You know, is it possible he was unaware of it? It seems unlikely. Maybe, maybe not. Did he go with them? Did he encourage them? It, it's a subject of huge debate. But there are people today in the Lubavitch communities that believe that this guy is transmorphed into some sort of godly light. It sounds almost eerily similar to Christian. It's very unfortunate. Um, there are those that believe he's not dead, he's still alive. You actually, if you actually go to Crown Heights, they actually have, he still gives out dollar bills. <coughs> they, you actually have his, like his stender, his stand, mm-hmm. where he prayed, and, and he used to give people dollar bills. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they still go today, and they all pass by, and he gives them dollar bills. But they actually have someone behind it, like, oh, like he's slipping geez. dollars out. It's listen. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, well, that that may, may, yeah. uh, may, there maybe they're trying to keep a tradition alive, but they're, they're, they're you know people say I got a dollar bill from the Rebbe. You well, know the Rebbe's been dead for more than twenty years. And that's at seven seventy seven. Seven seventy, right? Yeah, seven seventy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, either way, uh, there are those that have pointed to very disturbing corollaries between the ancient Judeo Christians and. The modern now, but, uh, now just to be just just to make it clear, there are very uh, responsible voices in that community sure. that are trying to make it clear that yes, the Rebbe was a fantastic leader and very dynamic and great Torah scholar, and maybe he could have been Messiah, mm-hmm. but now he's dead and we have to move on mm-hmm. uh, because everyone could see where this goes. You know, this is we've been down this road before, and we don't want to go down there again. And they have some very brilliant. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. And listen. I don't think Rabbi Traxler, well, I used to go to some of his ones you've learned. You know Rabbi Yeah, Traxler. yeah. I don't think he believes that. Yeah, I, I used to sit at Yossi Groma, and he never. Well, he, well that's the hope. Um, it's, um, I met a guy who told me that th- this is such a volatile issue because. Yes. In, the, in their communities, there are like different families. What, some of them are called the Mishachist families and some of the non Mishachist families. That's like the first question they ask if they should intermarry uh, is what is your belief with regards to the Mashiach? Mm-hmm. You know, because it's, it's a very volatile issue and it's not so clear who believes what. Um, you want to make, make sure that you don't marry. It means if, if, if you're a regular Lubavitch family, you want to make sure that you're not going to marry someone that believes that the Rebbe's God or the Rebbe's Messiah or the Rebbe's alive or anything, any nonsense like that. And I, I, I think, I hope that most of them don't believe that. Like, like you say, I think most of them don't believe that. I, I don't know why they feel they have to believe it. I mean, I can understand they may have wanted him to, but once he's dead, and apparently he didn't rise, unless they think he's going to rise, there's no free Well, if they here, think he's going to rise, that's a problem. Well, sure, but I mean, <laughs> 5,000 years from now. Yeah. Well, yeah. If he didn't rise, why can't they just assume it's going to be someone else? Like, it's, 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 this Moshiach. What, what well, makes well, well, it's uh, it's. I'll 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 I'll, I'll demonstrate. Why do we need that picture? I'll demonstrate to you that it's actually it's 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 more broad. 
The idea of Mashiach is the idea of progress. Right? We talk about society progressing, right? Constantly becoming better and better, more developed. Mm-hmm. That's an idea that's technology. that's everywhere. That's right. That's the idea of like eventually this Can this will be a bit. Technology yes. to Mashiach? No, 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 but the attitude of 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 a developing and evolving and improving world, mm-hmm. steadily and progressively improving, that's the idea of Mashiach. That's where it comes from. Of course. Okay, so do you believe that this society should get better and is becoming better and progressively better? Right, but I'm not looking for a, an individual. Well, it, it, the, the individual is 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 is, is the, um, you know, we talk about a two thousand years of Mashiach, right? The the, the mm-hmm. Jewish or sort of two thousand years of Mashiach. No individual is is, is presiding over two thousand years. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. The individual is akin to Abraham, who is the force and the uh, and the voice behind a movement. But that's not what the movement is limited to, correct? Correct. So I would agree with you. I would agree with you. So the idea of Mashiach can be very narrowly understood as an individual, mm-hmm. but broadly is understood as development, pr- progress, change, improvement. That's the idea. And that's idea, that, that, that idea is accepted by almost but everyone, right? But doesn't an individual in our, our teachings have to usher it in? I mean, doesn't there well, no. I, I th- it, it might be the individual that's there at the end. Right. Mm-hmm. Hey, listen, we we look at Abraham as contributing to progress and development and morality and improvement of the world, very much so. But he, but Mashiach is a description of a world that is at the end game, at the end point. Mm-hmm. I, I, this is my personal opinion. I think people cling to stuff like that because they want certainty and they want to believe in a tangible happy ending. Mm-hmm. But I think to tie that to what you say, if you look at that as the idea that it's just this big thing of progress and it's not one person, there's no there's no easy to hold happy ending in that. Like it's a big idea that goes on forever and there's lots of Well not say forever. And, well, we don't and, we well, have a time two thousand years. And we as individual people will just play our one little part in that one time. But it doesn't give us a sense of certainty and finality and everything being okay in the end. And I think that's what people want. I think they want to—they want but every day to feel like they have it figured out and to believe that what they're doing today is working towards a single point happy ending. And so they get sucked into that line of thinking. And then when it fails, they don't have a picture outside of it. Or when they try to telegraph how it's going to happen. Yeah. They say, oh, this is how it's going to happen with this guy and this process and this timeline. And they want to make it black and white. Yeah, so the, and, that, and that indeed is, is you know, and, and if that's the approach that they're, they're married to, so to speak, then, and that doesn't happen the way, exactly the way they have, uh, you know, have progra- prognosticated, that's very disturbing. But the idea of Mashiach in general is an idea that almost everyone, even secular people, atheists, also believe in progress. Right? What's progress? It means that the, the, our species, our race, is improving. That's exactly what Mashiach is. It's tikkun olam, becoming a better, more perfect but world. The irony is... And a per, the perfect world is the Mashiach. That's what we talk about. Isn't the irony... At least of course, there's going to be an individual who's going to be uh, at the forefront. And we'll talk about what this person has to do in a second. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. There are roles that this person has to do. Okay, but the ir- isn't the irony that, yeah, the me- messianic age, when it actually... When, the Messiah comes and all that, it, it, we say that'll be the end. But the truth is, isn't it the continuation? It's not really yeah, well, what happens What happens afterwards is a good question. That's right. That, that's yeah. right. That's right. That's There's right. There's no right. more nation living, uh, lifting up sword against nation, right? Right. Well, that's that's the Messi- Messianic era as right. well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about this Tolis issue. And I, I want to do this quickly because I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to. I want to get to that point of what the Messiah has to fulfill. What yes. what what check marks they have to actually uh, do? Okay, so so this is written a long time ago. We don't know exactly when it was when it was written, but it talks about the developing nascent Jewish Christian uh, movement, and there was a tremendous problem that the Jews were facing because you have a community where everyone goes to the same synagogue and does the same mitzvot, but some people are closet Christians. Now. What happens? Your your kid marries uh, someone, and like you find out later on, oh, they're actually Christians, but you would have no idea. Mm-hmm. So they have to try to find a way to, to, to wedge, make a wedge between the two communities, where people have to kind of choose their allegiances. You can't be both a Jew and a Christian. Uh, so the rabbis had a um, 
convention. Uh, and they said, well, what are, what are we going to do? And one guy by the name of Shimon, he says, we have no choice. We have to actually infiltrate the movement, rise to the top, and then abrogate the law. Right? Create, create a fifth, fifth column, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to use uh, clandestine means of actually changing it from within. And like, oh, the guys, people say, oh, fantastic. This is a great idea. We nominate you. Okay. And he's like, okay, finally he agrees to do it on condition that they guarantee him a, a portion of what's to come. Mm-hmm. This guy, this Shimon, uh, joins the movement, eventually rises to the top. He becomes the bishop of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. He eventually moves to Rome, <laughs> and he becomes the first pope. Mm-hmm. His name is Shimon Peter. Simon Peter. Simon yeah. Peter. And in... And, you know, it's interesting. His name is Peter. What is the word poter? Yeah. What does that mean? So it's, uh, it could come from the Greek perspective. But from, in Hebrew, the word poter or, means to absolve. When he says that the, the, the Christians don't need to observe the Torah anymore, right, he's poter them, so to speak, where he essentially gives a stamp of approval to Pauline Christianity, Wherein, in order to be a Christian, right, you don't need to observe any of the, any of the mitzvahs, any of the ritualistic mitzvahs, so to speak. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is maybe the Ten Commandments, love your fellows yourself, right? Believe in Jesus. That's all you need to be a Christian. Once that became the Christian, I mean, that that became the real Christianity as approved by Simon Peter, Shimon Peter, mm-hmm. then you can't be both. You have to choose. You can be Jew or Christian. And that is a great boon, great benefit for the Jews because now you, everyone knows where someone else is standing. Mm-hmm. Right? If you're a Jew who wants to kind of have both worlds, you can't. You've got to choose, are you a Jew or a Christian? So you have to choose. And once you make that decision, there's, you know, the, uh, the other option is untenable for you at that time. Um, indeed, we find that this guy actually was in clandestine communication with the rabbis, we actually have, according to a Jewish tradition, certain prayers that we say till, to, till this day were actually written by him. And till the end, he was loyal to the rabbis and loyal to the Jews. And indeed, um, he is the one who is in charge of splitting the two religions from each other. Not only that, we find some cool other things in this book that he actually wrote, or he determined what goes in and what, what is included, what is excluded from the Christian canon. He was one who ensured that the, um, that the language of the church will always be Latin. And not only that, we have a tradition that he gave names to the Latin alphabet. And we have a Jewish source, ancient Jewish source, that points out that if you actually take the Latin alphabet, what are the three middle letters of the Latin alphabet? No idea. So 26 letters, 10 on this side, 10 on that. So what are the three middle? L, M, N. What does that mean in Hebrew? L, M, N. What does L mean? L, L. L means God. L is God in Hebrew. Aim, M. What does that word mother. mean? Mother, Ain. Without. Without. Actually, what we find is that in the in the Latin alphabet, in the middle, like right in the middle, we, which uh, in Jewish tradition is actually authored by this guy, this Shimon, this Shimon who became Simon Peter. L M N is the middle, which means God has no mother. You can't be a God and have a mom. Because a god means that someone is not bound by the same rules. Yeah. So that's but what's this, what's this coming from? The Jewish source? The Jewish, the Jewish perspective. what's its context? Well, we actually even have the Talmud. The Talmud says uh, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the Gentiles don't have any books of their own. Mm-hmm. And they don't have any alphabet of their own. Mm-hmm. And Rashi there tells us, well, other people wrote it for them. Well, actually, but if you look, they do have their own alphabet, mm-hmm. right? But it all makes sense once you understand, once you look at this perspective of, of Tosefta and Asri, which is that 
uh, we actually sent someone in to infiltrate, mm -hmm. and he actually determined what goes in and what goes out. And he made sure that the Christian Bible presented Jesus as some sort of deity. Right? Which is very different from being the Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a Jew who wants to believe in Jesus, you'll, and you, but you want to believe him within the confines of the Jewish uh, approach, mm -hmm. well, then he has to be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. you, can't believe, you can't be believe in Judaism and believe in Jesus, the deity. But if Shimon comes around and he says, well, the Jewish, can the Christian canon is going to present him as a deity. Well, there's no option to present him as just the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And he dropped these little hints that, well, by the way, you know, it's all a bunch of baloney. Mm -hmm. LMM. How cool is that? God has no mother. <laughs> That's the English alphabet, not in the Latin alphabet. Well, these are Latin letters, right? Mm -hmm. Right, A, B, C's. Aren't, aren't the 26 letters? There are 26 yeah. letters. But yeah. the ones you turn on one side, turn on the other. No, I'm just saying, if you just, the if, you just if, you, if, you, if you look at the three middle letters. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, in conclusion, like why, w how do we know for sure that, that Jesus fulfills none of the categories, uh, none of the requirements of being... <laughs> Uh, of being a uh, of being the Jewish Messiah and certainly not the Jew not, not not any sort of deity that's of course nonsense but let's just work through this uh, so first of all we said that Messiah the individual has to be a king from the house of David who studies Torah and performs mitzvahs like David compels the Jews to follow the Torah and will fight the wars of Hashem these are the four ma major categories now as to whether or not Jesus being from the house of David, we find in, in Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3, very different genealogies of Jesus. I mean, in the, in the actual books, we can't find an agreement as to who this guy actually comes from. Uh, in one instance, um, Joseph's father is a fellow by the name of Jacob. In another, another instance, J Joseph's father is a fellow by the name of Eli. So in the, in, in the Christian books themselves, there is a direct contradiction as to who is uh, the grandfather of Jesus. Well, Not they, only that. They have an explanation of it. I've never understood it. Yeah, yeah well, I'm saying you'll, you will come up with an explanation for anything. Sure. But you have divergent yeah. genealogical paths. It's very hard to trace that back to. That's number one. Number two, um, the idea of virgin birth that also does means how do you have a dad? How do you directly uh, descend from the house of David via your dad if you've got if you don't have dad. one? The whole thing doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Not only that, um, Jesus is not someone who upheld the tradition of David. We know we have a, in the book of John a um, declaration that he didn't observe the Shabbos. Mm -hmm. He himself was not fully observant of Torah law, and he did not compel the Jews to follow the Torah and did not fight the wars, wars of Hashem. He did, the, he did the exact opposite. So he fits not, none of the character profile of Messiah as he fit. What about Messiah's accomplishments? Rebuild the temple? He didn't do it. Gather the Jews from all the corners of the earth? Didn't, didn't do that. Reestablish Jewish law of Israel? Didn't do that. Reinstitute sacrifice? Didn't do that. Fix the entire world to worship God? Didn't do that. Reestablish the Jewish Supreme Court of the Sanhedrin? Didn't do that. Uh, restart the Jewish calendar with the laws of Shemitah and Yovo. We don't have that. We have 2,000 years of none of these things being fulfilled. Why are we saying that this guy who may or may not have lived 2,000 years ago is the right guy? It seems very bizarre. Wasn't it supp he's supposed to also uh, stop wars? Oh, yeah, and the, 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 the Messianic era. That's right. That's right. So we find, um, we find uh, the Messianic era that there's no famine, there's no war. There's no competition, even. There's no envy and competition. There's such abundance. Um, and no pursuit other than seeking out God. None of these are true, are fulfilled. We are not living in the Messianic era. And all... Go ahead. Didn't Jesus also said in Matthew 10 that he didn't bring, came to bring peace, but wars? A sword. Okay. Seems nobody, very... Nobody ever looks at God. It seems very bizarre, and, and, and I'm not asking these advanced questions. I'm just saying, no. let's go through all the requirements and all the qualifications and all the accomplishments and all the descriptions of the Messianic era, and we find none of them being fulfilled. 
Why do we even consider that he's the right guy? It seems very strange. Mm-hmm. He doesn't fill any, 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 any of the categories. And the idea of him being a deity is, is obviously ludicrous from our perspective. Um, we have so many different sources in the Torah talking about God not having any parts, not being comprised of any uh, of any uh, of any uh, form, not having a body. It's very bizarre. It seems you know. It, it's certainly you know. Um, I can go through the sources, but everyone knows. Everyone knows these sources. You know. Uh, that's true. So, well, what they actually believe is a big question. Yeah, I mean, ev- like modern day Christianity as it exists is a is a million little split off of the Catholic yeah. Church through history. But there's yeah. and then and then splitting off the of each other. But, yeah, but the ideology is going to be either some variant of Jesus is the but, Messiah or Jesus is some sort of God or Son of God or yeah. some of that. But nonsense. isn't there major schisms between the Catholic and Protestant? There are, there are, but the baseline ideas and the source texts are the same. Sure, it's, I mean, it's basically you've got, you've got the you've got the Roman Catholic Church and you've got the Eastern Orthodox Church, right. and then those belief systems that that, that was kind of a first split, and, Luther, and then Martin Luther, Luther and the Protestant that. Reformation, and then there was a split, and then throughout history you have people just continuing to chop up the same pie into smaller pieces, sure. but nobody's actually believing anything different from their original parent right I under, but I've seen Protestant stuff where they call the Pope the Antichrist well yeah you know, yeah. And, uh, still, yeah, yeah they're still yeah, they're yeah, still functioning yeah. within Catholics they're functioning they're within that belief system it seems clear that they're, they're still within yeah. a system and that it's still the Pope a fascination at they're, all right. like they're giving him any sort of credibility at all means they're still functioning within that belief system and the question is yeah, yeah, I got you. you see what I'm saying yep, yep, it's yep. going to be some variant of Jesus is Messiah or Jesus is some sort of deity and both of those are nonsense yeah. um, uh-huh. now that being said we, we do believe that, 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 that Christianity has helped us in making the idea of God or one God or at least some variant of that mm-hmm. popular in the world uh-huh. and um, but the idea They've of stopped ma- killing us recently, and that's that's handy. nice isn't that wonderful yeah. <laughs> isn't, they're not the current yeah thing. and it's, yeah. it's also bizarre that they present themselves as the religion of love <laughs> let's look let's look at the history of the love that we've gotten let's look yeah. let's look. The Crusades. yeah and we've got what like a, a good 60 years of Christians not actively trying to kill us so that's nice it is wonderful. Hey, yeah. They only lifted the decree against the Jews in Spain in the 60s. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. was like recently. I mean, we, we, don't, we, don't even ha- we don't even have 100 years of well, Christians not trying to kill us. 68 in Poland. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and don't be so sure that it, it stopped forever. Yeah. Don't be so sure. Like, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. if there's a lull in, in anti Semitism. <laughs> Yeah. That's all it is. By the way, everyone talks about this uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric that's been happening in the United States recently. Ooh, there's more building against us. Well, there's more hate crimes against yeah. Jews in the United States than anyone else. Yeah. Well, absolutely. In the United States, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the, the the Europe, which is which which yeah. is a disaster in regards to anti-Semitism. There's yeah. a lot of anti-Semitism here in the United States. Thankfully, it's not as overt as it was in the past. Mm-hmm. But it's it would be foolhardy to think that we have beaten this. <laughs> You know this beast, this anti-Semitic yeah. beast, uh, forever. See, a lot of Christians blame Muslims because of the, you know they're killing Christians, and they blame us Jews because of that they're killing Christians. Yeah. I don't understand that type of logic. Yeah. So there, well, the, the, there is no logic. logic. Yeah. There is no logic here. So that's that, guys. I think um, what we, we for sure have learned is that there is a lot of nuance and subtleties and complexities about what the Jews actually say about, about, about Jesus. It's not cut and dried. Um, is it possible some of the Talmudic references are actually talking about the same guy? Who knows? I think it is possible. I think it's maybe even likely that some of the references, is it the one that was 100 years before the Common Era? Is it the one that's 100 years after Jesus is reported to have lived? Is it the toast of us that says that maybe we did kill him, like that episode? Um, is it Ben Stada, Ben Pandira? Who knows? Um, but I think what is clear is that it's not, it's not clear, and it's very yeah. easily be taken, out, taken out of context. Uh, and if you're looking for an excuse to hate Jews, you, you have enough you fodder to work with. Yeah. You, you, have enough, you have enough to work with. You say, oh, we're for, when it says Yeshu, <laughs> when it says Bilam, it's him. When it says Shemesh Dachim Lavor, referring to him. There's a lot of ways that you, you know, if, if, if your desired goal is to hate Jews, you don't have to go very far to find some sort of material. Mm-hmm. 
to help you along that uh, that plan. Well, Rob, I was just going to ask. I know you're summing it up, and it's very interesting. Go ahead. Uh, but there is nothing in all of our, even if you construe, as I think you're saying, some of this stuff as anti-Christian, quote-unquote, uh, sources in the Jewish uh, text. There was never any advocacy, was there not, of by any Jewish source or Jewish person that Christians should be uh, exterminated. Oh, never. Okay. No. That, that doesn't say anything of that sort. Okay. Anything of that sort. So never. Was, That's not know, the Jewish way. Polemical criticism and all. Of oh yeah, we we disagree with him. We're a different religion. <laughs> we disagree with him, and we and, and we're basing no it upon arguments. Mind. There's no Jewish mind comp. Chas Hashem. God forbid. We don't. No. That's, we don't work like that. We um, only eat babies. Uh, unless, he said we only eat babies. Unless we need their blood for matzah, but besides yeah. for that, uh, yeah. that's a yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, go ahead. No, I, I have a question. Going back to the Elena. Yes. Um, we kind of skipped over that. You mentioned the words in parentheses. Yes. And the mm-hmm. Christian is in parentheses because of because it was censored, censored out. Censored it. Right. Yeah. So the, what they did was, when they put them back, they put them back because they've been outside of the text for hundreds of years. Oh. They put them back in. Some people still say them. Some people don't say them. They put them in, in parentheses. And the other thing is, uh, I did find the article about uh, the Orthodox rabbis. Um, um, embracing Christianity? Embracing Christianity. Yeah, Orthodox not rabbis. Embracing, embracing it in what not, No, no, no. It's on Facebook. I don't know if they're on Facebook. I don't But I just, I mean, I just... It, You're not missing much, Steve, I assure you. One of the rabbis that they uh, <laughs> quote is Rabbi Shlomo Rishkin. Well, um, about what? Well, about what? What's I'm it just say? curious. Well, you have about. to read, I mean, you really have to read the well, article. Well, what's the crux of it? I mean, what are they doing? They're just saying that they want to work with Christians. They're not Oh, like interfaith? The same. See, that's what I know Andrea and I have had a couple of debates on that. But I, yeah. I embrace Christians, and particularly fundamentalist Christians. For political reasons and for personal reasons. Listen, they, you know, the the biggest supporters of Israel in the United States. The, yeah, so, yeah. so it, but, but that's that's not an ideological well, partnership. It's, good for no. it's a political. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a politically, you know, we're very happy that when the Christians support Israel and think, don't support you know, slaughtering us, that's Reverend, very nice. Uh, Reverend, what's his, the one in San Antonio? Hagee. Hagee. Pastor Hagee. He's far more Jewish than most Jews. It's, this says a group of prominent Orthodox rabbis in Israel, the United States and Europe, have issued a historic public statement affirming Christianity is the, quote, will, divine outcome, and gift to the nations. Well, and urging Jews and Christians to work together. Well, that, that, that doesn't yes. sound so That's dramatic because, right. yeah, well, we even said that, Maimonides said that, that, that it has an ultimate goal for humanity, for the Paul world. John said that about the Jews, I think. We're thanks, th- th- thank him for his endorsement. Mm-hmm. We appreciate it. Well, but I mean, uh, but isn't this the same similar type of thing that she's saying on the uh, Orthodox? Huh? Uh, well, no. I think it, it, it's it's okay to work together politically, you know. And and even I I, I was once watching a uh, an interview that someone had with uh, uh, with Netanyahu, and he said, "What about the all the." the evangelical Christians that support Israel, but the only reason why they're supporting Israel is because they believe when the Jews get back to Israel, that it'll bring Jesus that'll bring back. Jesus yeah. back. That's, That's right. Fine, you know. And then whoever doesn't co- convert to Christianity will be, be killed. He's like, yeah. So he said, listen, but you know, let's deal with that when it comes. Yeah, there... Baptismals, which we all know are mixed. Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's, 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 you know, let's, we'll let's get all the Jews back to Israel, yeah. and then we'll deal with that problem when it comes. <laughs> We're not so worried. We're not quivering in our pants, I assure you. Okay, everyone. Thanks a lot. Very interesting. It's extremely, I mean, Mike Huckabee is just radical with his Jewish support. I mean, I um, do too. Everyone have a nice uh, holidays. We'll look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think we're two weeks. We'll be in touch about the exact uh, schedule.